This is Breathe California TV. I'm Terry Trumbull, a volunteer. Uh, Breathe California is the lung health organization for the state of California. Focus on this show is principally on prevention, which I consider to be a major weakness of uh, the medical field. Uh, anytime you go in with to see a doctor, the focus seems to be on fixing your problem rather than uh, uh, working on prevention. So today we're going to be talking with a leader in this area for years. I first met Fred Keeley, I think, as an aide to uh, Assemblyman Sam Farr. Uh, then he got elected to be a county supervisor and maxed out his time as a um, uh, assemblyman representing the Monterey Bay area. Um, and he's done so many good deeds. Um, Breathe California is a 111 year old organization, but uh, we reorganized with other the, the other Breathe California chapters in 2006. And Fred came as a keynote speaker and pumped everybody at the conference up about um, how important their work was for protecting people's health. So we'll be back with Fred after this public service announcement. Stick with us. We'll be back in about 30 seconds. The different therapeutic methods that we can help our um, very low socioeconomic status um, clients who have no alternatives, no, no anything, and they, there's still about 15 different resources we got out of this that if you have no resources, no service connection, you can still get aid. That they are connected, one encourages the other, and that the process of change from backing off from the tobacco is the same as backing off from any other addictive drug. Everyone can benefit from this training that we just were offered today. I would not take it back. Welcome back to Breathe California TV. Our guest today is Fred Keeley. Um, off air, I told our um, director that if it were up to me, I'd vote for F Fred for any president, um, supervisor, any other government position I could think of, because um, it's a little hard to find anybody that's better at it than he's bad at it a supervisor, an assembly member, or just a member of the public. So Fred, uh, I warned you that we're going to talk about things like Sempervirin Society and uh, housing and energy, all of which you've played a big role. So uh, when I moved to Northern California, moved back to Northern California in 73, um, almost immediately made contact with a guy named Tony Look, and he and I worked together quite well on a wide variety of issues. But when Tony retired as Sempervirin's executive director, at least in parts of the Bay Area, Sempervirin seemed to have disappeared. And in the last 10 years, it seems to have a, had a rebirth and uh, maybe you can talk about what you've done there. They list you uh, on an annual report that I got about a week ago as Redwood Circle. Um, the director and I think that's because maybe you're wooden. You got any rebuttal on this? <laughs> well, as I mentioned before, I think it means that I'm a, a carbon sink. Maybe it's I'm a carbon-based life form, but... Uh, in any event, Terry, it's good to see you again. It's always good to see you. And thank you for your good work over the years on behalf of the lungs of every Californian. Uh, very much appreciated. The uh, uh, Back to Sempervirin. Sempervirin was founded in the early 1900s by a group of folks, mostly from Stanford University, as it turns out, who went on a camping trip uh, into the Santa Cruz Mountains and they got a look, a deep look, deep into the forest of first growth redwoods and were absolutely amazed and uh, stunned by their beauty, 
their age, uh, what a magical place a redwood forest is. And they literally passed a hat to form the Semper Virens Fund. And Semper Virens is the Latin word for redwood tree. And they got that going. And uh, what happened over, excuse me, <clears throat> what happened over several decades was that Semper Virens became the nonprofit buddy of the State Parks Department. As the state of California became more knowledgeable about and interested in redwood forests, which grow in a fairly restricted range of coastal areas near ocean, near the ocean, uh, that gets fog coming in at night and out in the morning. And these redwood trees through something called evapotranspiration, they take in the water in the fog uh, into their, what amount to leaves essentially. And they each drink about 300 gallons of water a day uh, just from the fog coming in and going out. And that's how they survive. And so they don't grow in a great range. They don't grow very much farther south. They don't grow very much farther north. They kind of grow in the central northern California, southern Oregon range. And over the years, the State Parks Department has had interest in acquiring redwood forest land for a variety of reasons. And in the modern era, because redwoods are such a terrifically good carbon sink. Uh, they grow sometimes to a thousand or two thousand years old. Uh, they, as a consequence, they absorb an enormous amount of carbon. The uh, oh, I'm going to interrupt you for a second, Fred. Just be clear to our audience that carbon sink or retaining carbon is good these days. It's a very good thing. It's a very good thing. And so it comes out, carbon comes out of the, they take it out of the air, into the tree, keep it in the tree. And then of course they emit oxygen. So Semper Virens uh, as a fund has been the nonprofit buddy of the State Parks Department in acquiring redwood forested lands. And the reason they, especially you've seen this in the last couple of decades, they've really return to their core mission, uh, which is that we understand now that redwood forests, like all natural systems, are complex uh, and interrelated uh, in, in so many ways. And so by preserving redwood forests intact, the whole system of a redwood forest can remain intact. So the idea is that uh, rather than seeing parcels of land that are redwood forest uh, becoming here and there developed properties, uh, the Semper Virens Fund, when there is a willing seller, can move with some alacrity that State Parks Department can't because State Parks Department waits for periodic bond sales approved by the public. And so Semper Virens can step in quicker, acquire the land from a willing seller, keep the connectivity of the forest together, and then be bought out of that when the voters approve from time to time uh, natural resource and park bonds. So Semper Virens has been around a long time. It does very good work. And I think what it means when they say that I'm uh, part of a redwood circle is that perhaps I'm one of those folks that's been around a little bit and has helped them out over the years, but they are a terrifically good organization. So speaking of having been around for a year or two, yesterday I was in a, a meeting where um, people were very concerned about whether we have enough energy capacity. So in recent days, we've had some pretty bad threats of rolling blackouts and other things and air conditioning sucking up energy. But the one they were worried about was the um, 
governor's ban on fossil fuel cars uh, selling new ones in 2035. And do we in fact have enough electrical generation capacity to support that? Uh, you know that I um, have a home in Palo Alto and um, we're not allowed to have an electric car unless we get permission from our city, which is an electric utility, because they want to know what the drain is on their capacity. Um, so we've got a petition to them to, to uh, be able to charge our own uh, cars. So um, you were, um, in, during the 2000-2001 energy crisis in Cal California, I was very happy that you were willing to come to speak to my uh, energy policy classes at San Jose State and UC Santa Cruz about that problem. Um, what dilemmas do you um, see as a big picture guy with uh, our energy supplies? Terry, I, I think there's a couple of issues here. One is the 2000, 2001, 2002 energy crisis in California was, I believe, as the person who was designated by the Speaker of the Assembly at the time to be the chief operating officer for the assembly on trying to solve the energy crisis back then. Uh, that was a very different energy crisis because at the time, uh, it was not about whether or not there were enough electrons in the system to be able to get uh, to the user or the to the uh, demand side of the equation. What was going on in the early 2000s is that California in 1996, the legislature and the governor had deregulated the electricity sector of our economy based on a theory uh, that was adopted in the United Kingdom by Mar Margaret Thatcher when she was the prime minister. And the idea was to create a competitive market at the time. And uh, it, that was a mistake in California uh, because treating California's electricity system as if it was a commodities market uh, was a ser serious failure to understand commodities markets. And as a consequence, what happened is that the merchant generators gamed the system during this deregulation. Deregulation was based on the theory that you could have many buyers, many sellers, transparent transactions, and that that would create competition in the marketplace for generating and selling electricity. Uh, there were a couple of very serious errors made at that time that are very deep into policy, such as uh, not requiring reverse repurchase agreements and, uh, and so on. But the, the heart of the issue was they unfortunately set up a system which made it very easy to game the market. And that is what caused the energy crisis. Now it's a very different issue. It really is an issue of whether or not there are enough electrons in the system. The rolling brownouts and blackouts now are literally the demand side versus the supply side uh, the supply side from time to time is not sufficient to meet the demand side. That was not the case in the early 2000s. It was a market manipulation issue. I do think that uh, as California, uh, you made reference to Governor Newsom's executive order, uh, taking a look at, at uh, reducing and then eliminating the number of cars that can be sold as new cars in California with internal combustion engines, that what we will move to the most obvious is more and more electric vehicles query, how do those get sufficient electricity uh, to be able to move around without having the electricity supply side uh, collapse? And so that's a very real issue. You can see that when the legislature in the last two or three days of the legislative session, which just ended 
two or three days ago, the two-year session, when the governor and the Democratic majority uh, just reached an agreement on how to keep the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant online for a bit longer, a few more years uh, than had been anticipated. That has a lot of political ramifications for it uh, because of the, shall we say, uh, the not happy name that the nuclear industry has. And so it's uh, not a favorite uh, way to generate electricity in California. Diablo Canyon was scheduled to go offline in the fairly near future. Urgency legislation passed in the last couple of days. Senator John Laird from Santa Cruz, uh, who, whose district is a long, narrow coastal district, including Diablo Canyon, was key to negotiating a, a little bit longer, a somewhat longer period of time before it goes offline. And that is intended to keep that, that as well as the other supply sides of this equation robust enough to get through uh, while additional forms of electricity generation are developed as we transition from internal combustion engines to either electric or at some time maybe in the future moving, moving to hydrogen uh, fueled vehicles as well. So to jump in here just for our audience, um, the uh, extension of Diablo Canyon, given the bad name that nuclear power has, is basically a reflection of how short we are, as you describe it, of electrons. It's not that anybody's terribly fond about it. It's just the assumption in our electric system is that your local utility, PG&E, in the case of most of us, um, job is to supply whatever the public wants. And um, clearly, we need some changes in that. So we've been talking with uh, Fred Keeley, who's a professor at San Jose State. And are you teaching at Santa Cruz now? Uh, I am not. Uh, I've, I've guest lectured there, but I've my teaching is in the graduate program of public administration at San Jose State. And then uh, I teach a class with former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta uh, through the Panetta Institute. We teach third year Santa Clara law students a course entitled Achieving Consensus in a Partisan Environment. And we took his many decades and my less decades, but still quite a few. And we took a couple of years to build a syllabus for folks who want to go into public policy, maybe as a staffer, maybe as an elected official, uh, about how it is you can achieve public policy prox progress within a partisan environment. And what we tell students on the first day is, if you're interested in being a show horse, we don't have anything for you. Uh, <laughs> but if you want to be a workhorse, we've got all kinds of good stuff for you. And it's a wonderful class. And I feel privileged to get to work with Secretary Panetta, of course. You and I could really go off on a tangent on that uh, issue, because my experience with elected officials is the ones who are capable of getting the most done, who, who are those that give all the credit to other elected officials. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking with Fred after a 30 second public service announcement about housing, which uh, I view as arguably our most significant environmental issue um, in terms of what local government does. So we'll be back in about 30 seconds for more with Fred. My name is Renee Montez. I've been using the CPAP machine, I would guess, uh, 10 years. I, I got so accustomed to it, I don't uh, go anywhere without it. I take it with me everywhere. From the moment I put it on, um, I thought it was the greatest thing because the breathing was a lot easier. And uh, I, after using it for a couple nights, I felt uh, a lot of energy. Free California is fabulous. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, that 
smiling face in front of you is Fred Keeley. Um, so uh, our governor has um, decided that he needs, that we in California need to do more about housing. It's, uh, I think during Fred's and my lifetime, it's been a major issue. Um, and state legislature and governors have passed laws requiring cities to build more housing. Uh, I think Governor Newsom says we're 2 million units short and uh, some pretty draconian bills passed the legislature last year. Um, one of the questions I like asking experts like Fred is, are they gonna make any difference? And then talk about whether local government can actually deliver more housing units. Well, I think, Terry, that there's this is obviously a, a you set this up correctly. This has been a challenge, uh, not for the last six weeks or something or six months or six years. This is a, a challenge that California has failed to meet for quite some time. And I think there's at least two components to this. One is there are those with no homes at all, folks that are experiencing homeless in our homelessness in our state. And that is a, a massive issue unto itself with the complexities of, uh, of any community, but certainly folks who are experiencing homelessness, the percentage of folks, the number of folks in there that are experiencing homelessness, uh, having to do in parts with drug addiction, alcoholism, mental health, challenges, etc., uh, having lived very difficult lives and masking their pain with drugs and alcohol and, and other issues uh, is an enormous challenge in California. And I think that the California, the governor and the legislature, and for clarity's sake, uh, I'm an unrepentant Democrat, uh, but I also feel I have a duty from time to time to be critical of or at least challenge uh, leadership in that regard. Uh, and then there is the issue over here of housing generally with an emphasis on very low and low income housing. And so I think I, I, I want to set this up as a as uh, in the following way. The state of California last year, last fiscal year, had a $30 billion budget surplus. That means over and above everything that was required to be funded or even that the legislature and the governor wanted to fund, they still had another $30 billion on top of that. This year, the fiscal year that began July 1st of this year, just a month or so ago, that had a $97 billion surplus. $97 billion. That's larger than most state budgets in the United States. And California's budget surplus was $97 billion. Now, here comes the critical part. Every elected official I know of, Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, and Vegetarian, has <laughs> said over the past 10 years, send me to, now fill in the blank, city hall, county courthouse, state capitol. I'm going to deal with affordable housing. I'm going to do something on this. Now, the voters passed a $4 billion housing bond four years ago, that money was gone in a, in a New York minute. And since then, there've been a few billion here and a few billion there. But my challenge to them is this, if you really meant what you said when you've been campaigning for the last decade or so, that this is your most important issue, why didn't you take half of the $97 billion, because half of it by state constitution has to go to K-12 education? The other half, let's call it $45 billion for the heck of it. Why didn't you take that $45 billion, put it in a fund for cities and counties 
to help them reach their very low and low income housing numbers that are given to them by the state of California through a process called the Regional Housing Needs Allocation Process. Why didn't you do that? And if you didn't do that, which they didn't, why not put a $40 billion general obligation bond on the November ballot, which does not raise taxes because it has first claim on the general fund? They didn't do that either. So I've got to say, I really do question the actual commitment of the legislature and the governor to doing something on affordable housing. When you have a $97 billion budget surplus and you don't take that money or a significant portion of it and dedicate it to what you said is the highest priority issue for the last decade in California, I'm willing to at least say, I don't believe you when you say that it's your highest priority. What that does is it leaves cities and counties on their own. So when they pass things like SB 9 and 10, which give property owners by right the ability to divide their single family parcels into two and have your house plus two units, and on the new parcel, you can have up to six units, but none of those are required to be affordable. None of those are required to be deed restricted. Again, I ask the question, are you serious about trying to deal with housing affordability or homelessness? And those of us who either are in local government or aspire to be in local government in the next few years, we're going to end up having to put our own measures on the ballot, city by city, county by county, because the legislature and the governor have failed us in my estimation. Well, I, that's my perception is uh, I'm not seeing some stampede to put housing units all over the place with these bills that allow subdivisions that are inconsistent with local government plans. Um, so uh, we're getting directions to wrap up at this point. Um, you got some summary of your visit with us that you want to pass along to the public? I'll make it very quick. First of all, Terry, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be with you, to either see you in person or to be on your program. Thank you for that. And I do want to feel like maybe I left it on a bit of a, a negative note. I, I do believe that Californians genu genuinely want to solve problems such as air quality, affordable housing, and so on. And I think that that desire deep in the heart of Californians uh, may be somewhat deeper than it is in the hearts of some of the folks in Sacramento these days. But I believe that uh, at local government, we can, in fact, uh, solve a number of these problems because we're closer uh, to the people who can give us feedback on what to do correctly. But Terry, thank you very much. Pleasure being with you. Thank you very much for joining us, Fred. It's always a pleasure to talk with you with your range of experience. Thanks again. Good night. See you next week.